I'm Jeffrey Dotchis. That's how you pronounce the last name, if anyone cares. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for, for having me here. It's, uh, it's cool to come talk. Uh, I think I graduated in 91, 91 or 92. I don't, I, I, it's, it's all a little bit of a blur. Um, and uh, we started Razorfish in, in 1994. Uh, Razorfish today, I think, is the, is the second largest uh, digital advertising agency in the world. It's got about 2,500 or 2,700 employees uh, all around the world, about 400 million in revenue. Um, I left the company in 2001, but up to that point, we, uh, we grew the company very quickly um, from two of us in my East Village apartment to uh, over 2,200 employees in 15 cities in nine countries. Um, and we took it public in 1999 uh, and raised, I think, 55 million-ish dollars uh, in an IPO then. And, uh, and then uh, the company went private in 2002 or 2003. Um, and then since was bought by Microsoft um, as part of an Aquantive, a, a company called Aquantive, and then spun out of Microsoft and now sitting in its, I think, permanent home at Publicis, um, which is where, uh, under, under the Vivaki division for anyone that, that, uh, that follows that stuff. But anyway, um, that's a little bit of ancient history. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit of, you know, I don't know what you want to talk about tonight, but feel free to interject any questions you might have. Just go ahead and shout it out or save them till the end. Uh, that's cool, too. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my entrepreneurial process and how we started Dotchess Group. And I'll tell you a little bit about what Dotchess Group does. And then I'm going to sort of walk you through kind of how Dotchess Group arrived at where it is today and through that um, impart some, some thinking about, about entrepreneurialism and then perhaps some some insight as to sort of what we do now. Is that cool? Yeah? All right. Um, <clears throat> it's really important for all presentations to have um, fuzzy animals. And so make sure um, it's just a really good idea, no matter what you do, have fuzzy animals in your presentations. It sort of gets, gets things started um, and uh, it breaks the ice a little bit. Um, you know, the origins of Dotchess Group are, are interesting. We, we started with with nothing. Um, Dotchess Group today is, is, uh, is uh, helping big businesses connect and engage with their constituents um, using social technology, social media, both internally and externally. Um, and I'll get into that in a sec. Um, we started with this, uh, this thesis, this idea on a whiteboard um, that distributed technology in the hands of your constituents can create leveraged and emergent outcomes. If your constituents are x plus n, but n equals infinity. And I'll describe what I mean by that, but this was my thesis. I, I, had, I don't know where it, it happened in the shower, you know, the lightning bolt hit my head, and like all of a sudden, I was like, wow, there's this very powerful thing happening with social. Um, and I didn't quite get why it was so powerful, because initially, you know, when people were um, on, if you remember Six Degrees back in the day, or, um, Friendster, <clears throat> and then MySpace, and then Facebook, um, and then Twitter, um, and then Flickr, and then YouTube, and all of the sort of social activity. I couldn't really figure out why it was so interesting for somebody to tweet out, you know, I had a sandwich. You know, oh, I had a sandwich too, you know. You know I had a pastrami sandwich. You know. I had a turkey sandwich. Rye, mustard. Um, why, why does anybody care? You know, I mean, I know you care why you're sharing with your buddy, or you care why, you know, your mom gets to see your photos of the, of the, you know, of the, of the party the other night when you guys were playing beer pong and it was got all crazy. Um, but for the most part, you know, as individuals, it really, to me, didn't seem all that important, you know. Until I started to think about, what if 500,000 people had a sandwich and I knew about it as a business? What would you do? You'd park a sandwich truck right, like, where they were, right? You'd, 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 you'd take advantage of the data associated with all that connection and engagement that was occurring. That the data, that, the, that on aggregate, all of that information would become extremely interesting to a business if they could aggregate the data, make sense of what it meant, and take advantage of the activity that was going on and all that connection and engagement and, sh and sharing that was happening. And so I go back to distributed technologies in the hands of your constituents. When your constituents are X, me, plus N, when n equals infinity, there's a lot of power in that data, which leads to leveraged outcomes, which are outcomes that are enhanced by that network effect, 
or emergent outcomes, things that I wouldn't have imagined. I didn't know that everybody liked pumpernickel bread. I had no idea that pumpernickel was like the phenomena that, that uh, it certainly was with those 500,000 people eating those sandwiches. And so um, this was the thesis, and I, I started noodling on this for a while, and I, I just kind of, you know, just, just, it just hit me that this was going to be a, a powerful, powerful trend in the business world. And we tried to figure out how to articulate a funda fundamentally um, transformed organization, like organizations that were now truly meaningfully connecting and engaging with their constituents. What did that mean? How, did I, how, do, we artic art how do you articulate that new business, that new thing? Um, how do you define the challenges of adoption? Or how do you define a new authoring mode as a basis for organizational change? People are now connecting and communicating as part of the value exchange of doing business versus making something and trying to shout at you to hopefully buy it. It's a different way of, of doing things. And so we started, you know, drawing stuff on the board and I think the, probably the, the one interesting thing, there's a little bit up here that's interesting, but we started focusing on internal and external facets of the organization and trying to understand if you're a company to an individual, a company to many individuals, or a company to an individual who's connecting to other individuals, that this, were, this was the model that exponential power could come from. The number of connections here is an exponentially greater with every node you add to the network. And when n equals infinity, the power of that network is exponentially greater. And that started to get really exciting when I started to think about what businesses could do. And so we started to map a business model um, around what it meant to um, fundamentally transform the way business got done with this new connection and engagement that was happening in the marketplace today. How many of you all have, you know, Twitter accounts? Well, almost everybody. How many of you have Facebook accounts? Almost everybody. How many of you have watched a YouTube video? Everybody, right? How many have posted photos somewhere? Right? Um, I can keep going, right? How many of you have some form of location check-in and have checked in somewhere? How many of you have posted a ratings or review for a book or a, a product? Okay. Literally every one of you are participating in some way of some form of what I'll call post and display. You're just posting and displaying stuff, right? I'm posting and displaying a video. I'm posting and displaying my location. I'm posting and displaying ratings and reviews. I'm posting and displaying something. And all, the technology that's out there is only just, is it really just in, in simplest terms, some form of post and display. So I never get hung up on like the tools or the, or the technology. I always get, get, really get focused on why people are posting and displaying. What's so interesting about that? Um, and what can businesses do to encourage people to connect and engage more? Um, and so anyway, that social thing that we can now call you know, that, that, that's present today in all these forms of post and display, started to get me really excited. And I started to think about, again, how can businesses take advantage of all this connection and engagement that was occurring in the marketplace? Um, you'll see, you know, this is an interesting slide to me because it really represents what my business looks like today. Um, and I pull it out all the time with my staff because we're now 250 people in 13 cities and seven countries. And, um, you know, when we drew this, you know, there was three of us, and this was like 40 months ago. And so you sort of go, wait a second, you know, did I stay true to my vision? Was I, uh, was, I, was I true to the vision? Did I zig, did I zag? But was I true to what I set out to do? And this is what I set out to do, and I'll, I can describe what it is. Um, but that's what I'm doing today. And um, I'll get to that in a minute about staying true to vision and, and, and entrepreneurialism is really about having that vision and driving forward with that vision to completion, whatever that means for you. People always ask me, Jeff, what do you want to do? When do you, when do you want to exit? What's your exit strategy? I said, I don't have a exit strategy. I want to win. I don't want to exit. I want to do this forever. This is all I want to do. This is what I like doing. You know? I don't, I'm not in this for the money. I'm in this to win. And if you win, that other stuff kind of comes with it, right? So think about that when you plan what you're doing entrepreneurially. Of course you want to make a living. But what you want to do is figure out what that vision looks like and what it looks like to win and then work your way backwards with all the steps to where you are today and then start executing on that. You know? Figure out what it means to win in the game that you want to play in and then work your way backwards to get there. So anyway, um, so 
you know, all this sharing and changes, uh, sharing and posting and displaying and, and connecting and engaging um, was interesting, and we needed to come up with a business model that was going to work for why businesses were going to um, encourage connection and engagement. And we came up with a, a further step to that thesis. All of the web is becoming social. All businesses are doing business on the web. Therefore, all businesses will become social businesses. And I'll say that again. All businesses will become social businesses. All businesses will utilize technologies, distributed technology, to connect and engage with their constituents to create leveraged or emergent outcomes. So beyond the influence of media and the, the real opportunities, you know, you, you, hear the, you hear a lot of people talk about social media. It's not really about media, it's about business. Media is talking at people. Business is, social business is being connected and engaged. Yeah? So, you can read that, um, social business. So why is this happening? You know, there's a lot of trends in work and in society and in technology. Um, if you think about the trends in society, the millennial generation is coming into the workforce, the millennial generation is coming into the supply chain, and the millennial generation is coming into the consumer base. Millennial generation has been connected all their lives. They've been connected to the internet, they've been, they had cell phones that, you know, I used to carry a shoe size cell phone, and literally, like it was a shoe on my, uh, you know, you had to take it out of the trunk of the car, you know. Um, today, everybody's got like a supercomputer in their pocket. And so the millennial generation, you know, is a powerful force on the business world because you are now connecting and engaging the way you've always connected and engaged, of course. But you demand that that occurs in your work life. You demand that that occurs in the way you buy things. That you demand that that occurs in the way you're connecting and engaging with your friends and and, and associates. And so trends in society are shaping the way social business needs to occur. Trends in technology, of course, are happening. Miniaturization and the, uh, of all technology. I mean, things are getting smaller and faster. Um, increased battery life, increased uh, screen resolution, um, ubiquitous network activity, right? The network's always on. It's everywhere, pretty much. I mean, we used to, we created a, what used to be called a broadband site in 1997, but nobody had enough bandwidth to consume it. So a lot of innovation that, had, that, that, that w was thwarted you know, in, in, the, in the digital world by the lack of bandwidth. But you guys all have bandwidth now. So rapid shifts in technology. And then of course rapid shifts in the workforce. We operate in a global economy. You buy stuff from all around the world. You can sell stuff from all around the world and you source your supplies from all around the world. Or locally, if you're green, you know, I mean. But, but the point is that you're able, that this is a global economy now, and these trends in society and workforce and in technology are driving a shift from the industrial economy way of doing business, which was manufacture stuff, grind your labor into the smallest labor unit that you can, package up that item, and then advertise your way into selling it into markets. That's just not how business is going to get done in the networked economy. So we need a new distributed, collaborative, and agile organization that's able to surpass the current barriers to growth and create exponentially greater value. So while the shape of the business world has changed, most businesses, technologies, systems, and process, and culture have not. Now, for a lot of you folks that are working in traditional businesses, you know, it's pretty siloed still. You know, a lot of businesses don't communicate well. They, they're antisocial. They hoard information. People are worried. What if I share this information? My colleague is going to step on my neck and crush my head um, and keep me from getting that promotion at that job. I mean, there's 9, 10% unemployment. People are really worried about their jobs. What if I share more, more stuff? Then, you know, I could lose my job. So um, the workforce world of today and the business world of today is relatively siloed. Now it's changing, you know. It's changing, bit by bit, it's opening up. People are using the tools, but um, for the most part, it's still a highly siloed environment. Um, and we need to move to a different model. Again, this networked model, a networked economy model. You know, you have this industrial economy. I think we now are shifting to what I would call the networked economy, where connection and engagement are the currencies of value. How connected and engaged can you be with your constituents? The more connected and engaged you are, the more authentic your, con your communications are with them, and the more value you can exchange with those constituents because you're so connected and engaged with them. And because, when, because distributed technology enables 
n plus x when x, or x plus n when n equals infinity, connection and engagement becomes the value currency in those environments, in the networked economy. Does that make sense? Your meaningful connection and engagement. So just to sum up what, you know, sort of the, where the opportunities are in social business, you know, inescapable trends in society, workplace and technology. There's inherent trends between the past and the future, I mean tension between the past and the future. And so today, you know, businesses are going to fight like nails to keep their existing businesses intact as new businesses come on the scene with a more networked approach and um, attack those, those existing um, businesses. I saw this happen in the mid to late 90s, um, and it's sort of old war stories. But, you know, I used to tell everybody, you guys need a website. We've got to build a website for you. Well, what do I need a website for? Think about that question today. What do I need a website for? Every business has a website today, and you wouldn't question for one second why you need a website. And most businesses are doing business on the web. Yet, in 1994, 1995, and 1996, 1997, you couldn't even put your credit card into a website. People were worried that if you put your credit card into the website, people were going to steal your credit card information over the web. It's dangerous. The same thing's happening with social. People are, are, are worried about connection and engagement. They're worried and they're fearful about what it means to share and connect and engage. Yet most of you are, again, you know, with your YouTube and, and Flickr and, and Twitter and Facebook accounts, freely share information readily. And that's the way business is moving. Um, the shift is happening across all facets of business. This isn't about media or marketing. This is about business. <coughs> Fundamental change is required in systems process and culture. So you can, you can implement technology, but if you don't shift the culture or business process, the business isn't going to be successful. You can change process, but if you don't put in the technology or shift the culture, it's not going to be successful. And you have to have a culture that wants to connect and engage. Every single company will undergo some form of transformation to accommodate these shifts. And businesses that don't embrace this change and adapt are at a severe competitive disadvantage. So my, my gut is that this new environment, this new collaborative agile organization is going to surpass all current barriers to growth to create new value. So we came up with this theory called social business design that would enable businesses to have a, a, a way of operating that embraced that sort of the, the, the trends in the marketplace and were able to surpass the current barriers in, in business to create value. And it's about the intentional creation of socially calibrated business process, business culture, and business systems. It's intentional. It doesn't happen from the groundswell. It doesn't happen magically um, from the bottoms up. It's a business that makes an intentional choice to socially calibrate to become more connected and engaged, to reach out to its customers and its potential customers, to reach out to its employees and potential employees and previous employees, to reach out to its shareholders, to reach out to its suppliers, vendors, and distributors. And if you can design a business that's intentionally created to connect and engage, you're going to be able to um, establish that new, new way of doing business and a new set of values. So we came up with a set of vocabulary and building blocks called the social business archetypes. And these are core elements that are present in every successful social business, or will be. And it's a theoretical approach to, to doing that. The first is an ecosystem. <clears throat> you have to have a connected set of individuals, connected nodes on a network. The more nodes on the network, the more powerful the ecosystem. Make sense? It's the n, x plus n when n equals infinity. The more n you have, the more, the more powerful your network. A hive-minded culture, a culture of willingness to connect and engage where people's desire is to share and connect and communicate and participate and engage. Dynamic signal, a real-time signal, something that happens dynamically, not where there are static signals and um, those signals can get bogged down in asynchronous communication, a real-time set of signals. Um, and metafilter, the filtering capabilities associated with making sense of all that noise. So think about this for a sec. What are the most social businesses out there? Let's just pick a random one. Facebook, you know, um, what is it? It's an ecosystem of individuals, hive-minded, all willingness to connect, engage, and share. 
dynamically signaling, real time, this stuff happening all the time, right? And Metafilter, robust filtering capabilities to make meaning out of all that stuff. And if you think about, let's say, Twitter, an ecosystem of hive-minded individuals who are dynamically signaling. And a few years ago, Twitter did not have filtering capabilities, and Twitter did not take off until search and the ability to utilize hashtags and make meaning out of all that tweet noise, you know, became <coughs> valuable. So ecosystem, hive-minded individuals, dynamically signaling with metafilter capabilities imply the four core archetypes of what a social business could or would be. So let me talk a little bit about social business intelligence, which is making use of all that data. You know, today we all share stuff with the sort of tools that are out there today, right? I had a sandwich, I had a sandwich too. Um, I got five bucks off my sandwich, you know. I had a five foot sandwich, um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but all that stuff is really unstructured data and it sits, you know, on your hard drive or sits in the cloud, but I mean, it basically, like, nobody's really looking at it. It's, in, it's data that happens between individuals. And it's interesting, um, it's not that interesting on, a, on an individual basis sharing stuff between individuals. Um, and it's hard to analyze or hard to make sense of it. Businesses, however, have sort of groups of individuals that share data. And that data is largely structured. So you've got a lot of robust, you know, transactional data that happens between the groups of individuals inside businesses that are connecting and engaging. Where things really start to get interesting is when you take the social graph that individuals have and the business graph that businesses have and create the social business graph. The social business graph is trying to understand how all the individual data that happens out there can be aggregated, correlated, analyzed, and applied to behaviors that have measures and metrics associated with them that can drive business outcomes that have ROI attached to it. So all that, I had a sandwich. Well, what's your intention with that sandwich having? You know, that's that thing that you just said. That's some unstructured data between an individual. On aggregate, I can start to structure that data, analyze your sentiment, analyze where your location is, analyze what you meant by that. Did you mean to have a blimpy sandwich versus a Subway sandwich? You know, did you mean to, what, what, was, your, what was your intention? Um, and if we can correlate that unstructured data by dis establishing measures and metrics that drive behaviors that have business outcomes that we can calculate the ROI of a lot of that behavior. And that's where social business intelligence starts to become an extremely interesting idea, which leads back to, you know, that lightning bolt that I had in the shower. So here we are now looking at a transformed business where the old way of doing business is now a more connected and engaged way of um, dealing with customers, peers, um, partners, vendors, shareholders, and employees. So, you know, that led to the thinking that all businesses will transform into social businesses with every facet of their organization. They're going to do it with customers, partners, vendors, shareholders, employees, uh, and every facet of their company. Why? Well, or how, let me say. Um, you know, at Dodgers Group, at least, we've established um, a, a set of practice areas, a strategy practice, which helps businesses explore and organize for social an engagement practice which helps businesses connect, engage, listen, connect, engage, participate, and help those businesses, uh, help the individuals drive action. And then an intelligence practice that helps us um, understand insights that drive intelligence for the business and allows the business to take action on all that information. And um, it's interesting, some of that stuff's happening in social media marketing today, some of it's happening in social commerce, some of it's happening in social CRM, some of it's happening in enterprise too and some of it's happening in the social supply chain, but it's happening everywhere in businesses, everywhere inside businesses. They're trying to figure out how to connect and engage and make meaningful um, relationships with their constituents so that they can drive value. Why? It's strategic right now. I mean, I told you about the trends that were there, but businesses have to today begin to explore and organize for social. What kind of policies and procedures does a business have? What training and education do they have for their constituents? What decision rights are in place for the legal department to approve or not approve of things? What governance is in place? What, what, uh, what other components are present inside a business process that will enable that business to connect and engage when in the industrial economy model that they've been participating in the last 200 years, 
They've been antisocial. They've been trying to disconnect or disengage, right? How many of you have called your bank and got put into a phone tree, right? And what happens? They don't really want you to connect with a real person at some point, right? They don't, they, you, it seems like they don't, right? I mean, it seems like they don't want you to connect with a real person. Well, they don't. It costs like eight bucks a call for them. Why would you take the most important relationship you have, your customer support, and outsource it, <coughs> right? Put, it, put you into a phone tree and drive you to a call center somewhere out of the country. That doesn't sound like a company that values my customer relationship. That sounds like a company that wants my money or wants, and, and doesn't want to talk to me ever again. That's the industrial economy model of doing stuff, and we need to now move to this network economy model of doing stuff where people really connect and engage in a meaningful way. Now, I don't know about you, but like, I subscribe to at Delta Assist or whatever on Twitter. And when I fly Delta, like, I'm psyched when they've reached out to me and basically let me know that there's like, thunderstorms above Newark Airport and that I should like, think about another flight and, and reroute myself. It's really helpful to me. You know? I'm really appreciative of when a business reaches out. I'm almost shocked and amazed. You know? I don't know about you guys, but like, literally shocked and amazed. You know? um, I signed up for alerts on my trip here, and my flight was delayed coming out of, I live in Austin now, Austin, Texas. Um, and my flight was delayed. And I got the alert like, on the way to the airport. And I was like, yay, they're, they're, they're reaching out to me. Like, why, why is that such a big deal? You know, why should I be so shocked and amazed when, when they are doing what they're supposed to do? right? Connecting with me, letting me know the flight's going to be delayed. I should maybe think about another, another choice. Turns out it was on time. They sent me another alert letting me know it was going to be on time. And that was great because I was going to turn around and go back home for a little while. So that was cool. Anyway, so why it's strategic. The businesses now need to explore and organize for social. Why engagement? Listening to your customers, connecting with your customers, communicating with your or constituents, I'm sorry, not just customers. Listening, connecting, communicating, participating, engaging, driving action. Um, across the engagement spectrum. Don't just think about social as you know, Facebook, or don't just think about social as social media the way that it's described in the media. It's not social media, this is social business, and social business means connecting and engaging across the spectrum. Whether your customers are using Facebook and Twitter, or whether your employees are using Salesforce Chatter, or Yammer, or SharePoint, or Lotus Notes Connections, or whether your supply chain is in a supply chain community trying to drive prices down, all of those functions are connection and engagement, and businesses need to do all of them. And the technology and tools are going to change every year. There's going to be a new Foursquare. There's going to be a new Twitter. There's going to be a new bunch of stuff that comes into play. Almost, I don't say almost all, but many of the companies that were the powerhouse, heavy-hitting, like big companies in the late 90s don't exist today. They don't exist. They're not, even, they're not even players at all. So the tools and technologies that you see today in 10 years are not likely to be the tools and technologies that we're using. But people will build and expand and grow on those. Why intelligence? Again, 500,000 people having a sandwich is a lot of information, right? Intelligence and insights that drive action for a company. Um, and that's really, uh, really where all of this stuff is. It isn't really about Foursquare. It's about the Foursquare check-in data that businesses are going to have access to. It, you know, you're giving them all of that data that they're going to now get to figure out how many people are checking in in what locations and where should we target our, our messages and our information. They haven't quite figured it out yet, but they're going to. Same thing with Twitter. You know, same thing with Facebook Places or same thing with, with all that information. All that stuff is really a data play. And so social business intelligence, if you really think about this, is really where everything is going. Everything is moving towards social business intelligence. And that's exciting, by the way. This is it's so, like, if you're going to think about starting a business, like, get in the data business. Because today, you know, it's a greenfield opportunity right now to think about not what your favorite iPhone app is, but what's the data that's getting off of that app? How many people download that app and then use it? And what data is getting driven through that app? That's where the, the hot spot is. I mean, yes, if you develop Angry Birds, um, you can make a lot of money. Um, selling, you know, what do did, what did they shoot? Pigs? Is, is that, who plays Angry Birds? You play, right? right. What are you trying to like slingshot pigs, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So it's a great idea, you know. Um, and who would have thought about that? I never, I, I would have never thought they, the the flying pigs thing would, you know, throwing pigs at at stuff would would be a great idea. But, but it is. Um, 
if you think about Zynga, you guys, anyone play games on Facebook? Zynga games, Farmville, all that stuff, right? You do, right? Right? Do you have like a farm? No, it's Mafia Wars. But I Mafia Wars. All right. Do you have a farm? I used to have a farm. You had a farm. Did you buy? Did you ever buy virtual corn or anything? Uh, I gave my mom a gift card to buy stuff. You did. Okay. <laughs> so. People like have a farm on Facebook and then they buy like tractors and stuff with real money um, to farm their virtual farm and create virtual crops, which then they sell for virtual money, which then they can buy more virtual seed to farm their next farm, right, basically. And um, Zynga doesn't think about itself as a gaming company. If you ask the folks at Zynga what they think of themselves as, what? A data company. It's about data. It's about, they analyze by the minute what people are doing on all of their games and they figure out when to offer up that like you know that opportunity to buy the gift card at a discount or when to offer up that like sword so that you can slay the next dragon or when to offer up that machine gun to slay to to you know to dump the body in the river of the whatever right i mean you know um, and it's a data play so when you think about social and you think about social business don't think about social media think about social business um, it's about the data and intelligence and insights is really what that data is driving and when connections and engagement become the currency of value data and insights drive exponentially greater value does that make sense to take action so I'm gonna dig in a little bit um, on is this cool you guys are you guys good with this so far yeah all right I'm just kind of spewing so if you have questions or you know um, so Thinking about what kind of action businesses can take, um, there are, you know, if you, we, we, break, we break the world down into two sort of functions, sort of a connected company, internal, how do businesses function internally, and then how do they function externally. And the a big opportunity that I'm seeing today, right now, this very minute, in um, September of 2011, is what I'll call the the largest shift in the communication landscape in the history of mankind. I'll say that right now. We are right now, at this moment, in September of 2011, at the largest shift in the communication landscape in the history of mankind. We're at the crux, right now, this moment, right here, in New York City. You guys are all at this like special moment in time. And let's just take a moment of silence and savor it for a second because um, <laughs> You will. You will. You will remember this moment now. Just hold it. Hold. Hold on to it for a sec. Park it in your brain. Like in several years, you will look back and go, Jeff Dodges told me that I was at the crux of the largest shift in the communication landscape of the history of mankind, and he was right, or or he was full of shit. Um, <laughs> let's just say that I'm right for a sec. Think about it. The last 18 years for me have been developing this digital this digital thing. This I've been doing this for 18 years. Been working on this digital thing, helping big businesses get digital. And right now, I've never been more excited in my life about what's going on in the digital space, and specifically in social, and specifically around the ability for businesses to connect and engage in new ways and generate all this data, which is where the interesting stuff really lies. Right this moment, and Craig Bromberg's here. He's like Wave Craig or whatever. He and I, he's been around here for a long time too, doing this too. So I don't know why. <laughs> anyway. Um, so let's talk about this concept that we came up with called performance brand marketing, which is one of the big opportunities that I'm seeing in the digital space. The marketing world globally today spends $500 billion a year annually on marketing. $500 billion. It's a good number. It's a big number. It's growing a little bit, 2 or 3% a year, but largely... 500, it's a good, nice round number, $500 billion a year annually on, did, on, on, tradi on, on all marketing. The traditional marketing world, which is print, radio, television, and all sort of traditional brand, brand advertising, is $450 billion of, a year. And it's all the stuff, you know, it's the, it's the Subaru driving through the desert, charging ahead through the desert with the dust coming up the back. It's very exciting. It rounds the mountain. It splashes through the giant magical water pool that happens to be in the desert at that moment and the water splashes up over and then the Subaru stops and in that aggressive stance reminding you about sort of that active lifestyle that you have right and so that at, a, at the moment that you remember that your surfboard doesn't fit on your current car um, that you should maybe think about buying a Subaru for your active lifestyle right and they show that commercial to you enough times 
you know, to make, to hopefully make you have some affinity towards that brand when you think about it in the future when you're thinking about buying a car. And an enormous amount of money is spent just shouting at you, hoping that the time that you're about to buy the car, that you remember that one shout, right? And you develop some affinity for that brand. $450 billion a year. $50 billion a year is spent on digital marketing. And digital was zero 18 years ago. There was zero digital marketing before. Um, and now it's 50 billion, and it makes up 10% of the global spend. And that's a pretty, pretty good number. The reason why um, digital is so effective is because um, you can track and trace what people are doing in digital. You can, you can identify what they did, and you can um, put some dollar amount against that, 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 that whatever they did, and uh, receive some potential benefit. And, and the realm of digital has been taken over by, largely by performance marketers. Marketers that can drop a dollar in the funnel and see a dollar twenty come out every single time. They buy keywords. If you're, a credit, if you're a Capital One credit card company, you buy like all the credit card application keywords that exist out there, and then people are searching for credit card deals or whatever, and then they click on the keyword, and then they sign up to buy a credit card or to, to apply for a credit card. And Capital One knows that the amount of money they make off that consumer in the end, the one person that signs up for a credit card, is more than all the keywords that they bought you know, um, to get that customer. And they do that all day long. It's like a casino. I mean, they're just making money all day long with performance marketing. At some point, the keyword prices go up, and, they, and, and their arbitrage opportunity is no longer there. But, but social, uh, uh, search engine marketing and search engine optimization with Google have yielded this performance marketing opportunity for certain types of marketers that's really effective, it's really efficient, and it's, there's a huge business, the ad tech business, and New York has a very strong ad tech business um, that's all geared around um, helping marketers optimize that performance marketing spend. Google makes up 25 billion, or paid search makes up 25 billion of that 50 billion. So if you think about before Google, there was no paid search. And the other 25 billion is, is, is made up of uh, email marketers or um, display advertising. So Yahoo sells a ton of banner ads. How many of you guys have seen banner ads? <laughs> How many of you ever clicked on a banner ad? Ah, one banner ad clicker, two banner ad, three banner ad clickers. What was the banner ad, what? By accident. By accident you did, OK. <laughs> what was the banner ad you clicked on? Do you remember? One of your own ads, just to see if it clicked, right? Okay, and what about you? I can't even remember. Like, nobody sees banner ads. I have them turned off. I have an ad blocker on all my browsers. So I don't ever see banner ads. So banner ads are largely the realm of traditional brand marketers who are trying to spend money in digital. There's some brand, like the person at Triscuits or whatever, the cracker, you know, they're, they have a checkbox of stuff they have to do. Right? Like, you know, we, had, we, need, we need to do some search engine marketing. We need to do some banner ads. So they click, the, and they buy the banner ads, but like, no, nobody ever clicks on them. Like it's, and there's unlimited inventory. Like there's no scarcity of inventory with banners. So anyway, my point being that digital marketing is largely, the successful digital marketing is largely the realm of performance marketers. Because brand marketers can't really do well in digital. If you're Charmin toilet paper, you're not going to sell a lot of toilet paper by dropping a dollar in the search engine funnel. Nobody's going to click on anything, and you're not going to sell any toilet paper. Like it's not, it's not going to happen. So most, of, most marketing categories are not really effective in digital. They can't do much with banner ads. They can't really do much in display. Um, there's some email marketing capabilities, direct marketing capabilities. But for the most part, like performance marketers are, what, are who uses digital. And brand marketers are who uses traditional. Does that make sense? So this $450 billion op opportunity is interesting because if you can take the sort of audience size that social provides, right, in digital, with the data that social provides, which creates opportunities for insight in all of that data that exists in social and digital, and create a two-way feedback loop that allows for you to learn more about what people want and what they want to connect with and what they want to engage with and what they're interested in, 
That enables a closed loop ROI possibility for brand marketers within social in digital to have a meaningful performance-like characteristic to their brand marketing efforts. Yep. So mobile's just a distribution platform. People talk about mobile, it's like, but it's just another screen, right? So whether it's your laptop or your iPad or your iPhone, for, in my mind, wherever you're carrying, if, just because you can carry it doesn't mean it's um, a different thing. It sort of is in a little bit, a little bit because mobile has much more portability than your, let's say, your your t television at home does. But I don't really look at mobile as a as a separate category within digital. I look at mobile as a distribution platform for digital. Does that make sense? So if you think about and, and shout out questions if you have them. Um, so if you think about the idea that social can unlock the performance-like characteristics of, digi of digital marketing with the two-way engagement and meaningful connection that brand marketers crave, you can unlock the $450 billion that's parked over in brand marketing traditional media and have it fall into social. And that's an enormous opportunity. Again, here we are, the crux of the largest shift to the communication landscape of the history of mankind right now. That 450 billion bucks is about to head our way in social. It's extremely powerful. Brand marketers haven't had the ability to measure the concrete ROI for brand love or brand awareness or brand mind share or advocacy. They've never had that opportunity. They're, they're measuring clicker Nielsen happy faces when, you know, 1,200 Nielsen families or whatever. They're measuring Arbitron ratings. They're measuring mag the Magazine Publishing Association of America measures pass-along copies. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? The, w the way you set up the, the page rate for a full page ad in you know, the New York Times or in you know, pick your favorite magazine um, in Vogue. Vogue, se Vogue sells, let's say, whatever, I'm just gonna make up the number, but 50,000 copies or 100,000 copies a month, or maybe it's more, two million copies a month. But then they tell advertisers that people pass around those copies like two million more times. So they're really, they're selling four million copies in a way, right? Or really, it's like 10 million copies because people really, really, they, they pass them around to a lot of people. That's kind of bullshit, you know? So ad rates are based on these like fuzzy kind of crazy numbers that, the, I mean, you know, there's some science to it, but it's, it's kind of fuzzy. So for the first time, brand marketers can have the opportunity to create connected engagement that they can measure with social. And that's where this starts to get really cool. Because the data derived from all that connection and engagement can yield, you know, return on investment for brand marketers. And that's a concept we call performance brand marketing. At Dodgers Group, I'll just fuzz through this real quick. We've created a data practice um, with some uh, SaaS-based data applications, a, a data services business. We've created a managed services business, which I can dig into in a second. Um, and then we have a consulting business that largely supports um, and is the putty and the glue that kind of holds everything together. Um, the data services is what we're super excited about right now because clearly you can see I'm excited about the data. Um, so just to dig in a little bit about the data, we analyze um, conversations between tens of thousands of companies and brands in their engaged market. We have a big data platform that analyzes those conversations um, for sentiment analysis and in which, how people are feeling inside those conversations. We um, detect the execution of best practices and specific behaviors these companies can do and benchmark them against their peers, against other industry participants, and against best in class. And then we stack rank them um, into an application that we call um, the Social Business Index, which I'll get into in a second. But here, again, connecting behavior and intention with measures and metrics that I can correlate and analyze with business outcomes that have concrete ROI associated with them is the holy grail for marketers today. And that's what we're attempting to do, at least at the Dotras Group today. Um, we package all of that sort of machinery and, and data collection into a, a data services platform, and then we built applications on top of that. So this is all kind of happening behind the scenes. I've got you know, 300 people worldwide working 24-7, uh, you know, crowdsourcing data, sucking in data from APIs, um, screen scraping, um, entering data by hand. We bought a bunch of data from a bunch of data providers, and I've put all that into this 
um, big data and analytics platform uh, that we run uh, sort of behind the scenes, and then it's the applications that sit on top of that that allow us to do um, some of the activity here, and that's where things really get exciting. The first application we've launched just a week ago, you can look it up, is the Social Business Index, socialbusinessindex.com, um, and that index is, it looks like a financial site in a way. It ranks how social businesses are. Um, and I, I don't have a wireless connection here, but I can demo it for you if we can get one. It's pretty cool. Um, it ranks over uh, 20, 20 plus thousand companies, um, 26,000 brands, um, several hundred million social signals in real time. So the index is updated, the, the published index is updated every 15 minutes. And so, you know, for instance, last week, Kohl's, you know, shot up the index. Why do you think Kohl's shot up the index last week? Anybody know? Anybody know that the store Kohl's, you know? Anyone know? J-Lo. J-Lo announced the new clothing line last week, and people were talking about it. A lot of people were talking about it. And they, they boosted themselves in their index ranking. Uh, Coinstar, does anybody know that company, Coinstar, when you drop your coins off at the grocery store? Do you know what, other, you know what else they own? Redbox, right. Coinstar shot up the index two weeks ago, wondering why. God, I was like, why does, why does Coinstar, like what a, did are people like talking about their coins? No, um, but, but they announced, or they launched um, a trivia service on their Facebook page that um, they're now tweeting, they're, they're, they're uh, having trivia contests every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes on their Facebook page. And it's garnering huge engagement. People love trivia, people love movies. And so oddly, this comp strange company, Coinstar, shot up the rankings because of, of what we were learning about what's going on. The data started to become extremely interesting. You know, Target, what did Target just launch? Missoni, exactly. Boom, Target, shot up the index. Red Bull, boom, shot up the index. Anyone know what Red Bull just did? Art of Flight, a new cool like whole video thing that they did and, and, uh, and snowboarding, uh, extreme sports event that they've been doing. So it's really interesting to see how businesses are connecting and engaging in the marketplace and we've decided to collect all the data we could on the biggest companies in the world and then rank them. And um, that's the first application that sits on our data platform. It's free, it's free to the public and it's free to companies. Um, <clears throat> however, we're charging for additional lenses on that data. So you get a little bit for free, and <clears throat> as you start to ask questions about, hmm, I want to learn more about why Missoni did what at Target, or what did you know, Baby Gap do versus Gap versus you know, Banana Republic, and I want to try to understand more competitive analysis in the marketplace about connection and engagement and how it's driving meaningful ROI with business outcomes. That starts to get really interesting and really exciting as we start to approach what's happening in this now networked economy. Um, so the index itself, you move up in the index for positive engagement, you move down in the index for negative engagement. So Miss Sony had some problems on that target for those that, um, and I don't want to highlight what they were necessarily specifically, but there were, it, it was so overwhelmingly positive. People wanted this Miss Sony product at target so much that it crashed their website. So you could say that's a good thing, but target's been very, you know, probably pretty worried about that, I'd imagine, you know? Um, Right? So, was that what you were referring to? Yeah. <laughs> yep. So we've got a lot of companies in the index. Uh, uh, a lot are, are continuing to add data. If, you're, if you work for a big company, you can come in and, and harden and add the data to that company uh, stuff in the index. We've got a, a, a set of managed services and technology platforms we run, a listening platform, a social media marketing ma management platform, and a community platform that we run. It's exciting uh, just in that it helps businesses across that engagement spectrum, but I won't delve too much into that. Um, today we're representing over 40% of the Fortune 500 as our client base. Um, we're the world's largest social business firm. We, uh, we have the only data services platform like ours. Um, we have over 250 people in 13 cities and 7 countries. Um, we're profitable and um, we are sort of doing what, doing what we do, our little thing that we do in social business. And so um, I can delve in a little bit and ask, answer some questions. but. Um, you know, just to recap, you know, things have changed. Don't think business is going to get done the way that it's been getting done. Things have changed. We need a network business model to support it. Social business design is the intentional creation of, of socially calibrated businesses. You need to get organized for social. You need to engage across the social engagement spectrum. 
data is driving social business intelligence and social business intelligence drives action inside companies. And um, that's an exciting set of opportunities right now for you as individuals um, or for you as entrepreneurs who are looking into the marketplace and seeing what possibilities there are. Um, so thank you.